Today's episode of the DevEd podcast is produced by Thinkster.io. With the rapid pace of change to front-end and back-end frameworks alike, staying up to date with your skills can be tough, but it doesn't have to be. With our expert-led courses on Thinkster.io, you have instant access to hundreds of courses like our brand new 100 Days Algorithm Challenge course taught by Dylan Israel. We also have courses on topics ranging from Angular, Vue, React, and Python, Rails, Docker, and a lot more. You can even customize your learning path to include any combination of front-end and back-end technologies that are relevant to you. Thinkster.io, a better way to learn. Welcome to the DevEd Podcast. My name is Joe Eames. I'll be your host today. And on our panel, we have Brooke Avery. Hey, everybody. Jesse Sanders. Hey, hey. Mike Dane. Hey, everyone. Sam Jeline. Hey, everybody. And as a special guest today, we have Dylan Israel. Hola. So, uh, Dylan, since we uh, got you on here as a guest, do you want to take a quick minute and just kind of give us a little bit of your uh, background, biography sort of thing, and then we'll get into our episode? Yeah, so the elevator pitch for me is a little bit untraditional. I am, although it seems to be more and more of a standard nowadays, I'm a former computer science uh, dropout that was a pizza delivery driver and then sort of raised himself up and used nothing but free materials to go and land you know, high paying dev jobs and sort of grinding my way to the top. And I have a YouTube channel that, you know, has around 60,000 subscribers. And I've really been sharing my journey on there. And I've really fallen into this sort of content creation platform because as someone who has essentially learned from these online content creators and taught myself the, the skills to be it, I'm trying to give back in my own way. Awesome. So our episode today is... Learning data structures and algorithms. I'm excited for this episode quite a bit myself for a variety of reasons. But we have Dylan on because Dylan has a really awesome course over on Thinkster called the 100 Other 100 Algorithms Challenge. Dylan, do you want to tell us a little bit about that course? Yeah, so I think every developer, regardless of pretty much the stage in your career, can relate to that dreaded whiteboard interview or that dreaded technical interview where they're sitting down and whether it's relevant to your role or not, they want you to you know, take some two-dimensional array or string manipulation, whatever it is, and just like can see if you know, in their eyes you can code. And so I was struggling going and getting those roles. And I would always, it's part of it's nerves. I used to throw up before whiteboard interviews. And like, I was just so absolutely nervous. And that's sort of how the course came about. I spent several months just hammering this down, solving problem after problem after problem. And I took about 100 of the most common ones I got, and I threw in about 10 of some easy ones to ramp you up to make sure that, you know, here you have some practice problems, and in in my language of choice, which is JavaScript and TypeScript, and see how you might go about solving some of these things, and in some cases, multiple ways of solving them. Cool, cool. So I think before we get too far in this, we should define data structures and algorithms. Who wants to uh, kick in and tell us what in the heck is a data structure and what in the heck is an algorithm? Don't everybody jump at once. I'll jump in if you'd like. (laughs) We're we're making the poor guests do all the talking. No problem. I'll I'll take all the shine. Uh, Right now, uh, uh, you know, you'll hear data structures and algorithms quite a bit. And depending on sort of what field you're in, they can be more or less sort of detailed and go into more complex, I should say. But traditionally speaking, when you're talking about data structures, they really refer to how our data is organized. You know, you might have something like a set or an array or objects in in JavaScript, for instance. And then algorithms are really ways of parsing through those data structures to make sure that we are doing less iterations and the amount of, you know, we're not not doing so many calculations that it is uh, going to take an excess of time. And so that's sort of a very high level overview of data structures and algorithms. I can chime in too. I think that's a really good explanation. And I think more generally too, I've always seen that there's like two different sides of programming. One side is kind of like building with Lego blocks. So you're taking code that other people have written, maybe multiple pieces of code that other people have written and kind of gluing it together and building something. And I think that's one aspect of programming. And then there's another aspect where you're actually building those Lego blocks. You're building those building blocks. And I think that's where the data structures and the algorithms comes more in handy when you're building these libraries or you're building these tools that are going to be used by more people. So I think data structures and algorithms is more on that, you know, you're you're building the tools side of things. Anybody else want to chip in there? I like to think of algorithms as recipes, as finding the most efficient recipe to produce something, sort of like baking a cake. 
sometimes like, these computer sciencey words can scare people off. <laughs> right. Like I look at data structures and algorithms oftentimes as the stuff that we use all the time that we maybe don't necessarily realize we're, we're using, especially for people that haven't been what you might call formally trained, right? In the subject, if you didn't go to computer science class, you just picked up programming as it stands, right? Like all day long, we write algorithms. It's just the code that we write essentially becomes an algorithm because we're, our code does something. So that's an algorithm. The study of, and then same thing with data structures, we're using data structures. We may not think about it as such, right? Even just a simple variable technically is a, is a data structure because it's some kind of a thing that holds some data. Then we've got the concept of like the common or classic data structures and algorithms, things that we use a lot, things that people build that could be used in various ways. And so in a sense, I think the study of data, I see the study of data structures and algorithms as a study of common ways to do things that we will likely run into over and over and over again. For example, imagine programming and only ever using primitives inside of variables, right? A single variable, never using an array, never using an object in JavaScript, for example, right? Never using lists of anything, just variables that would be hard, maybe impossible. But we have all these common ones and understanding how they work and the, the patterns and their performance and implications could be uh, useful and important. Joe, I think that's a great point. I equate it back to design patterns. So just another way of saying what you were saying is a known solution to a, a given problem. And that there's like best practices on, on ways of solving problems. And, and so data structures and algorithms is just a, an opportunity often comes up like in job interviews to be able to display what, what concepts do you understand and what have you been exposed to? All right. So first real question here, why in the heck should you even bother learning data structures or algorithms? I mean, I, I think the most practical answer is because you want to get a job. Uh, so like, the majority of high paying jobs out there are going to test you. Now they may not test you on, you know, if you interview with like when like Microsoft, Google, they're going to ask those more computer science data struct algorithms. You understand breadth first search, binary search, and they might even ask you to solve problems in using exactly that. I would say maybe about 80% of companies are just going to actually see if you can solve a problem and, you know, write your own algorithm, something that's more of the use case, but that is the barrier of entry. The barrier of entry is, Hey, here is a problem. Now, using data structures and algorithms, solve it. And that's really, if, if you want to sort of get a good job, especially if you want to get a high paying job, the higher paying the job is that typically the, the more data structure and algorithm heavy it is. That's sort of the very fundamental, just basic entry line to get in. But, but then algorithms also help you spend less time debugging and they optimize your code. So those would be other reasons to learn it. And then, it, you know, your software is going to run faster using the same hardware. So it's, it's cheaper to scale. There's a story. I'm going to have to look this up. So what was that World War II story where the, the team of British coders went in there and they cracked Hitler's code? Hitler had been sending messages to his... Alan Turing, yes. yes. Thank you. So Hitler was sending out all these messages and nobody could crack these codes. But then Alan Turing went in with his team... And they figured out that all of the messages were ending with Heil Hitler or something like that. And using that, they were able to then go in, figure out all the rest of the code, and basically solve you know, all of these hidden messages that Hitler was having sent out to his Nazi armies. So I guess if you want to get extreme with it, you could also say that knowing algorithms, learning algorithms is a way to solve problems. And obviously nothing is extreme as, you know, World War II saving history, but they are there for solving problems with your day-to-day -day job. So there's, there's a number of reasons to learn algorithms. Another thing too is I, I think when you're doing data structures and algorithms, it forces you to think a little bit differently than you normally would, which I ultimately I think is a good thing. And it's another reason that that's often brought up a lot in interviews. People want to see can you think in this algorithmic style, which isn't always necessary for computer programming, but definitely in certain aspects of the field, it's super necessary. So I think learning algorithms also teaches you how to think in that way, which is, which is important. I'm having a hard time coming up with the, trying to top Burke with the, you might save the world answer. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty <laughs> There's That's no some pretty big stuff. Yeah, it's hard to follow. Yeah. She, dropped, she dropped a big bomb. Big <laughs> Mic drop. I feel like for me, the, the most practical for me was 
learning about space and time complexity of algorithms that 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 sort of directly impacted my code and understanding just even the fundamental ideas of understanding that like nested loops are going to run slower than not nested loops and things like that i feel, i feel like things like linked lists and and those other data structures they they are helpful in certain situations but i think the broader concepts of how to write more performant code really helped me a lot early on. So I'm going to throw out here a little bit of a challenge, right? I'd like to have people kind of come back and challenge what I'm going to say here. So I oftentimes tell people that the stuff that you learn in computer science class in university is the type of stuff that you're rarely, if ever, going to use in the real world. So as an example, I learned some of the basic algorithms and data structures when I was in school. And the stuff that I learned that I wouldn't have just naturally used in my day-to-day job just by learning programming without any sort of study, right? Just the stuff that I would have just naturally learned. The number of times that that became useful in my career, I could probably count on one hand outside of an interview, right? So here's the challenge. I'm going to make this, I'm going to make a statement. I want you to prove me wrong that learning data structures, learning algorithms is outside of an interview, useless and a waste of time. I mean, didn't we just decide that it's saved World War II? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, we just, hard to repeat that. Yeah. <laughs> so I can answer that a little bit because when I was in boot camp, that was the kind of stuff that I wish we had done more. I wanted something, like I was craving something to help me, like what Mike was saying, change my mindset, get into the right mental space to start then using, you know, React and uh, Angular and all these other frameworks. But I, I wish that we had had more of that. I feel like it's kind of the, the first step that you take to just get yourself in that proper mindset before you then launch more fully into more advanced development. I tend to agree with Joe's sentiment, but I, I have had to use it on certain occasions. Like I think if you look at stats on how long people stay on a website before they like, oh, you know, you lose Amazon by speed are like a tenth of a second makes hundreds of millions of more dollars. And, you know, things like that is I've had to do that for own, my own e-commerce platforms where they have very complex data structures, even if it's because the data structure is just poorly written and you need to manipulate it on the front end and do some stuff that you probably shouldn't be doing. And then saying, hey, I was able to get this page to load faster. And now we're going to increase our you know, our sales numbers and, you know, make money. That's why all these companies have websites, right? Or web apps or whatever field you're working in. But by and large, at least it's been my personal experience, other than trying to get those speed efficiency gains, which are very important. You know, it is it is a fair statement to say that a lot of the time that interview is a very big part as to why people study traditional sort of algorithms and data structures. Hence the purpose of your course, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I'm a pretty practical guy. So, if you understand where you're going from, and if you really understand the fundamentals of space and time complexity, like we want to store as little as we can, and we want to do as few calculations as we can, then if you understand that, that's really the major benefits of data structures and algorithms. And then go, being able to go and practice and being able to implement that in various ways is what's important. Right. The only time I really seriously studied data structures and algorithms was preparing to interview at Google. Even like your general interview questions, I understood most of them well enough to implement, you know, reasonable answers without like a classical study of data structures and algorithms. But when I wanted to interview for Google, I knew that they were going to be really, really, really hardcore. So I spent a lot of time, but that was literally it for me. Number of times you've implemented a linked list by hand or implemented binary search by hand. Totally get that, Joe. But I think the other thing to consider here is like, if you want to level up your skills as a developer being more solid in these algorithms, like that's a really great way to expand your understanding. I know for a lot of us, it's been a lot of years since we've been exposed to these types of things. So interview is great. And I get that that's very practical, but I also look at it. If I was, you know, mentoring uh, developers within like my own organization, this might be a class I would recommend just to have developers sharpen their skill set. Just like I might also have them uh, look at design patterns and, and other known solutions to given problems to help them level up because as developers, we're constantly bombarded by problems that we're trying to find solutions for. And the more tools that we have, you know, in our belt, the the better, you know, we we are equipped to uh, appropriately deal with those. I actually agree with that, Jesse, but I think there, I see a difference between 
like design patterns and algorithms. Like to me, I think a design pattern is more of a like a high level solution to a problem, whereas an algorithm is more of like the nuts and bolts. So I actually, I, I'll agree with Joe on this, which I think that, yeah, I mean, I don't think that it's necessarily super useful. I mean, I can make an argument for learning data structures, but ultimately I think the industry is moving in a way where we just keep abstracting things and things just keep getting higher level and those lower level like algorithms and how the data is actually stored, I think is less important. Right. I still see value though. I think it's an endurance exercise. I think it's a way for developers or future developers uh, accustomed to dealing with complexity and thinking through problems and finding solutions to problems. Also, understanding data structures is, in my opinion, even not implementing them. I'm not talking about implementing a a linked list, but knowing the difference between I should use an array or use an object if you're using JavaScript or knowing the difference of which, should I use an enumer or, or struct if I'm using C sharp or something like that. Or should I go with a class? Do I need it? Do I need something as heavy-handed as a class? So understanding the data structures of your language or your, the tooling that you're using, I think is very, very useful. And again, on the algorithm part, it's more about developing that endurance and the solving problem skills that you get out of those exercises. That's, I think that's where a lot of the gain happens. And maybe that this is why companies like Google they want to make sure that when they hire someone, it's someone that is willing to go through that pain and that they can figure stuff out, think outside the box. So I, th- I think there's still value on those. I would agree with that. I'll like kind of go back on my own challenge here. There is something to be said for understanding the data structures that we use. For example, ta- let's talk JavaScript. Like our, our two basic data structures are objects and arrays. Right? If you understand that an object is actually a hash, and what the underlying data structure of hash, how it actually works. There are plenty of times where I've seen people, you you know, if somebody's going to collect data together, multiple pieces of data, they'll always use a list, right? Sorry, they'll always use an array. They'll use an array as any kind of a list. But there are definitely times when, uh, I don't talk about like a list of regular regular pieces of data. I've got like five things that are all the same, right? And so almost all the time we use something like an array. But if you understand that if you're constantly doing index of to find an item in that array, then you probably should be actually using an object because the, now the problem the problem here is if it's actually five items, it matters not at all. It doesn't even make a difference whether you're using five items or not. Of course, the uh, the code might be a little bit simpler one way or the other, but the performance doesn't matter at all. But when you're talking about a few hundred or a few thousand items, all of a sudden the access time becomes significantly different for calling index of versus actually like using an object and just calling the key to find the item in the in an object or in the hash, essentially treating an object as a hash. So definitely times when you look at that and you realize, okay, somebody's implementing it this way, they still have a fundamental understanding of the objects that you're using every day. So there's something to be said for just at least learn and understand the things that you use every day. I kind of feel like, and this would challenge your your original question, but I mean, if we take this role back to very simple terms, this would be like saying that it's okay for for children to learn the steps of how to solve fractions without actually learning why they're doing what they're doing. So it's it's sort of like teaching a monkey see monkey do. You know, yeah, I can watch my teacher and, and they can teach me how to do how to solve fractions, but if you never teach a child why they're doing it, then they never actually learn the essentials of what's going on. They're not truly understanding what's going on. So I I feel like it's sort of the same principle here. If you don't actually take the time to break things down into very simple terms, you're not, I think eventually you would get it, you know, as developers, but I think it's just setting yourself up for more success if you, right from the beginning, take the time to really break things down and understand them fundamentally rather than just learning how to go through the motions of, oh, this is, you know, how the array works, blah, blah, blah. But really breaking it down and understanding it, I think just helps make you a a stronger developer right from the beginning. Yeah, kind of to wrap up on that, 99% of the time, you you don't need these algorithms, but it's it's that 1% of the times when things aren't working, when you don't really understand what the underpinnings are that you're, you're not able to abstract and, and get to that next level and figure out how, to, how you're going to solve this problem. To me, those are, that, that's just that next level thinking, getting above, you know, hey, here's how we do things on a day-to-day basis when things are going well, but here's where when we 
we come across a problem, it might be performance or it might be, you know, uh, some other bug that if we don't understand the underpinnings, it's very difficult for us to be able to understand how we might approach the problem and come well, up with a, a better solution. And I would certainly say, even though I've never implemented binary search myself, understanding what binary search is and how it works has made a huge difference far more often than I've, you know, obviously than I've ever implemented it myself. So understanding things, understanding how objects and arrays work and how their access works so that you can understand the performance implications of certain things does matter. One of the things that I have as a goal for devchat.tv is to cover technologies that are up and coming, things that we're probably going to have to deal with on a more regular basis in the future. Some of these include AI, VR, and one of them is blockchain. So I reached out to one of the experts that I knew, Gregory McCubbin, and we pulled together a few other people and we've started a podcast called Adventures in Blockchain. So if you're looking at blockchain as something that you may want to work in, something that you're curious about learning more about, or something that you just want to keep current on until you have the opportunity to make a career jump and go over and work in blockchain and crypto, then definitely check out Adventures in Blockchain. You can find it at adventuresinblockchain.io. Let's turn to the next question, which is, if you want to study data structures and algorithms, uh, you decided if it's just for the purely practical and pragmatic reason of getting a job, or if it's for other reasons, what are the best ways to study and to learn these things? For me, I, I think it depends on what your objective is in general, because there are going to be just some, hey, I need you to speak to it very well. Then there's going to be, I need you to be able to actually practice this very well. And so having your own whiteboard and writing these things out and following courses or I know a book that really helped me that sort of the cliche book that everyone talks about is, you know, cracking the coding interview. And it's kind of crazy that that book even exists. Like, it's like, it's like, hey, here's the cheat sheet for interviews for just the interview. It's not called learn data structures and algorithms. It's called cracking the coding interview. But that was definitely something I always found to be very helpful. Right. It is sort of a recognition of this is about one specific purpose, getting the job. That is kind of funny, right? We yeah, don't but, have a learning Angular for the interview, right? There's it, it sort of reminds me back to when I was in school and I remember taking these courses relevant to that and you know, you instantly forget it because you know, don't use it every day. And so you're just like, I just have to memorize some of this stuff so I can pass the final. And it's almost like that where I just have to sort of memorize some of this and hopefully get, understand some of it, but it's for the sole purpose. But that was some a resource that always helped me. So uh, I want to talk a little bit about my experience when I made a fairly serious study of this and kind of go through the steps that I took. So I interviewed with Google twice over a six-month period, right? The first interview, I spent a little bit of time studying because my friend warned me to, you need, oh, there's going to be hardcore on data structures algorithms. I went and it was just like so pathetic how much I crashed and burned in that interview. It was, it was so sad. I think they, they gave me like a consolation prize and, and a hug with, you know, good try. They gave me a pat on the back. That was a good try. So I got decided I was going to get serious. I was going to really study hard. I, I uh, was going to be able to re-interview six months later. So I must have spent like 300 hours, but I bought the code, cracking the coding interview. This is back in like 2012. I bought that. I, was, I spent a lot of, I found a bunch of websites. I discovered there's this whole like industry about helping people prepare and get through the interviews for the big silicon Valley firms, Google and Microsoft. In fact, there's places where you can go and find out the questions that the interviewers are likely to ask based on the actual company, right? Are you interviewing at Facebook? They're going to ask these types of things, people reporting their experiences. Did you see on that note recently, there's an article on LinkedIn where a former Amazon engineer on their Airbnb offers like a upsell service for $5,000 to do like a 10-hour mock Amazon interview. Oh my like, gosh. Just ridiculous. That's funny. Well, when I was looking around at the time, there were places that for a fee, they would actually like basically consult with you. And yeah, we're talking about 5,000. Well, that's a lot, but it was, they were either services or people who were actually interviewers, but, or had been interviewers and they would, you know, for a consulting, 150 an hour or something like that, sit down and do mock interviews with you and things like that and work with you. So yeah, there's a whole industry around this. But so one of the things that I did was because the interviews are on a whiteboard, I actually, I didn't use a whiteboard. Instead, I used a pad of paper and, and a pencil. Well, actually, I used a pen or maybe I used a pencil. But anyway, I wrote it by hand rather than uh, I, you know, I practiced this stuff over and over and over again. So every day I spend almost two hours practicing doing algorithms for like six months on a pad of paper to simulate being on a whiteboard. 
Yeah, that's, that was pretty similar to how I prepared. I, uh, I, one of the worst experiences of my life was interviewing with Microsoft. Not that they were very bad. It was just the most grueling thing ever mm-hmm. where <laughs> it lasted about eight hours and it was every hour you did about three different algorithms where, so like by the second hour, your brain is just like spaghetti and you're like, you're just knocking out. And, and so like, if I was to sort of try and prepare for that again, I think I would have to try not only do like an hour or two at a time, I think I'd have to do like at least once a week, like six hours so that you could actually make that sort of marathon of preparing for these interviews. So there's, there's a ton of data structure and algorithm resources out there. And I've probably watched a lot of them. But I've definitely found that actually doing them is how you actually learn. Like sitting there and handwriting out the answers and working through whether it's Leet Code or Dylan's course or Interview Cake or any of those things, like actually solving problems. Because the thing is that what I found is like these data structures and algorithms, when you first approach them, seem like this foreign language and a bunch of crazy words. And then you get into it and you learn that like you're actually just sort of learning to solve these problems, like the specific subset of problems. And there's a finite number of them. There's not an infinite, it's not like an infinite span of knowledge you have to learn. And that helped me a lot was to start seeing the same patterns in the problems. And I still have a long way to go in it, honestly. Yeah, I totally agree with that. I think it's spot on. Like there's so many just patterns, you know, you take one pattern and then you can have like a hundred questions that are kind of based off of it, but just learning how to take a step back when you're studying these things and recognize what those patterns are. And like, oh, this is a situation where you want to use this type of search or this type of data structure. And being able to just recognize like the macro patterns and all of that, I think can be really useful. You don't want to get too wrapped up in the weeds of these things. I don't plan on interviewing on any of the big boys, but if I had to, I would probably practice the algorithms on a different language from something I, I understand. And I think it's, a, it's an extra exercise because now that forces you to, it's not because you want to learn the other language, but, it, but it's more because you want to really master the idea behind the algorithm. So doing it on something different from what you know is going to give you that extra home. I would do that if I had to. That's an interesting technique. I also did find that there was a lot of places that listed a lot of practice algorithms that you could go and find. Dilla's course, obviously, being a great one. There's a hundred of them all, all right there together. And not only are they there, but then Dylan shows how to solve them. And not just showing a solution. A lot of places will list them and show a solution, but Dylan actually walks through them and explains the solutions as well and kind of gives his opinions on his solutions as, as well. So again, that's a good aspect of this sort of practice. But definitely, in my opinion, as with everything, the key was practice, 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 hours a day for months and months and months in order to prepare to interview well at Google. It's an interesting thing because you have to, like everything has an opportunity cost where you say, okay, I'm going to prepare three to six months studying data structures and algorithms for that big payoff. And then you wonder like, well, what did I give up in those three to six months to study data structures and algorithms? In that time, I could have picked up maybe the solid principles, clean code, test-driven development. I could have if you're front end, you could probably have picked up back end. And so a lot of this, you, you sort of have to weigh the pros and cons and know what you want. And if your goal is to really land at one of those large companies, it's usually that's usually the thing that you're going to have to study. Right. That's a good point, though. Like this idea that you're spending so much time just drilling these data structures and algorithms when we've already kind of discussed that maybe they're not super useful, even when you're at one of these big companies. So it's like, just learning them, I think, for the sake of learning them, I don't, I don't know that I would say that that's super valuable. I think, yeah, you're right. You could learn back end or you could learn a new framework. You could read we clean could, code. You could do anything. And in six months, you could start a startup and launch a web, yeah. fully functional web application <laughs> and have, you know, build 10 courses and learn 10 different things. And so it, there's always an opportunity cost associated with this. So as long as you know what you're going for and what you're doing, like to me, I would, I personally value, like when I'm interviewing candidates, I have to make sure that they understand the fundamentals. So like in your language of choice, do you understand why you would use an array, why you'd use an object? And do you understand why you don't want to have nested for loops and, you know, big O notation? But then I want to know, like, what are the, what are your principles when you write code and sort of those higher level things and see if you have any and and how, how you use them to your advantage. Right, right. I think there's, in addition to, uh, all the opportunity costs, though, there is some value to understanding 
the performance implications is going to come up. It's one of those things uh, we had Uncle Bob on the show on the podcast, what, a month, month and a half ago. One of the things that he said, I, I love requoting, which was, it's the things that don't change that really matter. Right? Data structures and algorithms are one of those things that it's going to be, it's going to apply no matter what framework, language, which side of the wire you work on, whether you're front and back end or somewhere in between. That's the type of thing that it's knowledge that will pay off, maybe not as directly as learning another front end framework to go get a job in that framework. But again, if you can't even pass the test, you know, the basic whiteboard encoding test, then even if you do know the framework, you might not get that job. But it is the kind of thing that is going to pay off a long time. And I do think, especially early on in your career, practicing these, what they call, I think I've heard them called toy problems, frequently is a really good idea because it just helps you get more and more into the mode of thinking logically, right? My girlfriend's trying to learn to code right now and going to do like a coding boot camp and all that. And she's struggling with things like reversing strings and all those sort of basic things. And she's getting very frustrated. And like, I, I remember that pain very well. And I say, you have to remember that you are reprogramming your brain. You are now looking at the world in a different view. When you see a, a problem, you're now dissecting it and figuring out how to solve it. And so there is that part of data structures and algorithms where if you have that foundation of, because that's what it is, you're just, you're just dissecting it into space and time and figuring out the best way to go about it. And so it's, it's something that is, as a foundational skill, can be very valuable. Jesse, I have a question for you. You run a uh, consulting shop. You do a lot of direct hiring yourself, right? Mm -hmm. How much does this sort of stuff play into your decisions? You're not a, you don't run a big, uh, last I checked, uh, Breebug wasn't as big as Google. I don't know if that's grown that much. That has changed, no. Okay. So your process is probably a little bit more hands-on, but how much do these sorts of things apply in your hiring decision-making? Definitely not eight hours worth of uh, um, algorithms and whiteboarding, but we, we do try to bring some of that in to the mix. It really depends on the level of the developer. Um, a lot of our, our developers are, are very senior Angular developers that we know within the community. We probably do a lot less whiteboarding with them. But if we're trying to assess skills with somebody, I, I think it's an important part where, especially what I want to measure somebody in terms of what is their upside. They may not have the exact skill set that we're looking for immediately today, but we want to be able to measure like what's their ability to understand and as well as learn. So we might be giving them a few hints during this process and see whether or not we're getting uh, deer in the headlight sort of looks, or if they're able to take that information, process it and go, oh, hey, let me, let me apply that right here. I hope that answers your, your question. Yeah, well enough. How about for the rest of you as you interview, how, how much does data structures and algorithms knowledge play into your decision-making process? I know when I'm interviewing people and can candidates, whether it's front or back end, I always focus on fundamentals. Sometimes I focus on data structures. Algorithms, not so much in a sort of a technical screen. I do want them to solve a basic algorithm problem, like a fizz buzz sort of difficulty type problem uh, to make sure that they can you know, problem solve. But then I focus on things like testing and I focus on what principles and design patterns to follow. And then do you understand the fundamentals of, let's say, JavaScript or whatever language of choice we're using? And in terms of frameworks, I ask zero framework questions. I don't care if you know the framework or not. Can I see by your answers and by your work history that you have the ability to learn and grow? Because, you know, you pick up JavaScript fine and you go from Angular to React. If you, if you only know Angular, for instance, in the front end, and we make a transition next year to React, I don't want to have a developer that memorized the whole framework instead of understanding what the framework does and what sort of how it's put together. Yeah, I think piggybacking off of that too, I would say another thing that I, I would look for is knowledge of like design patterns because that's basically what frameworks are just helping you to implement these design patterns. And so do people know the right ways to put software together? Do they know the patterns that make for a good, testable, extendable software system? I think more so than like being able to implement a specific algorithm or data structure, like can they actually put usable code together that's going to make up a system? Let's go and go move into like maybe one sort of a final wrap up question. The data structures and algorithms does have parallels the job acquisition process, right? It's heavily used in that part. So when we talk about it, we're often talking about interviewing and that sort of thing. Let's give out some advice here. 
people who are preparing for jobs, whether they're the early parts of their career or they just feel like their data structures and algorithms knowledge may not be as complete as they want. One piece of advice you would give to somebody, you know, learn this, do this, uh, here's a cool tool, something like that. A piece of advice you would give to somebody that's preparing for interviewing for jobs. You know, one thing I've been thinking this whole time is you guys have, have said everything so well. So I've been sitting here quietly, but like one thing you've been repeating over and over again is that it comes down to practice. You've really got to just sit down and give the time to practice and, you know, that repetition. But one thing we've not said yet is the value of doing it with someone else as well. And, you know, once you've solved it your way, looking at how they solved it and asking them, why did you do it that way? And learning their thought process behind it too, because I think there's value in seeing and learning that like you figured it out your way, but did somebody else do it another way that makes a little bit more sense? Or is it just the same? But, you know, it's kind of what we're all saying here. It's you have to learn a new way of thinking. And I think that there's a lot of value in sitting down with someone else and just getting inside their head a little bit too. So that would be my advice is just going to meetups or finding someone who can go through it with you and drawing off of the value of learning their approach to things as well. Yeah, the, that consistency is just probably the most crucial thing about getting better at anything. And so sort of one thing I, I say to myself and like my subscribers is when you're, when you're a developer, you should get good, you should get great, and then you should get better. And if you go and have that consistent attitude where you're taking one step forward every single day, maybe the first year you go, you say, I'm going to spend the next three months killing it on data structures, algorithms, come back nine months later and do it again and see how much of that you retain, see how much of that you can grow. And because these things, they, they, they're not going to change. They're going to be something you're going to need to work with and understand. And you'll find out that maybe you understand it a little bit better because now you've applied it for a year and you're able to go through it much faster. And some of those lesser ones that you don't use as much, now maybe you're going to understand them a little bit quicker and a little bit more in depth. One thing I'll say, and this is actually something I was, I've been getting into recently is like test-driven development over the last like six months or so. I've been really diving deep into that. And TDD is actually can be used to solve some like common algorithms. And there's some courses out there on how to do that. But it's, it's an, an interesting way of solving some algorithmic problems because a lot of times these things kind of rely on you to just have these, I don't know, just like these moments of insight, like, oh, I need to do it like this. But there's a, a kind of an incremental approach that you can take with test-driven development to just kind of build the algorithm out without having to have some big moment of insight. So it's something to look into if you struggle with creating these algorithms is like doing it in a test-driven development way. I like that. Uh, one piece of advice I would give us to interview a lot. There's no better practice than being in the real thing. So I interviewed a lot. I think it's okay to interview even if you're not seriously looking for a job. It could practice for you. It's practice for the, uh, the interviewers as well. And I'm sure they're happy to get the chance to try to hire you. Yeah, I, uh, minus the first few months of my career, I've interviewed 24-7 because you know, if a good opportunity comes along, I should accept it or my employer should match it, which they're probably not going to be too happy hearing that if they're listening. <laughs> but but that's, a, that's the honest thing is, I, you know, you work very hard and you should reap the rewards. Je Jesse said that we should edit that out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah, get, get rid of that. You know, I, I think what you mentioned earlier, Joe, about researching, I actually mentioned by a couple of people, researching who you're interviewing with. And I think even in, in some instances, just asking, like, so what is the interview going to be like? And so that you know up front what, what you're walking into. A lot of people will be very forthcoming and say, hey, you know, we're really going to focus around this. You should understand these concepts, uh, whatnot. But know your enemy, I guess, if you will. Know what you're going to be up against and, and you know, just prepare for it. Um, I also really like the idea that I think it's hard to walk in into an interview. You've, you have an interview, let's say, in two or three years and to walk into an interview and expect that you're going to nail it. If you haven't been in that interviewing space for a while, you might want to interview at a couple of places that maybe aren't your number one selection first and get a little bit of practice under your belt before you go in and botch the one that you really want. So that'd be my, my advice. Yeah, you got you to be able to accept that rejection. Luckily, early on in my dating life, I was beaten down quite frequently. So getting rejected by a company is not nearly as bad. Uh, but I think, <laughs> I think it's an important part of it as well. 
I really like that idea of just asking the interviewer what it's going to be like. I, I don't know that I've ever heard anyone say that, but that's, I like that. Just be like, what kind of stuff should I study? You know, instead of just going into some black box, like actually ask them what kind of stuff they're going to be asking you. I, I feel like people would probably be pretty open to, to that if you actually ask. I've recently had somebody reach out to me on, on LinkedIn, uh, you know, that was going to be interviewed in two days. And I've, I know for me, like, you're not going to give them general questions, but you're going to point them in the right direction and say, these are the five to 10 main topics that we're going to be covering. And oddly enough, those two people did very poorly. So I don't know if they did anything with it, but (laughs) (laughs) I think they were just trying to impress me like, yeah, that's great show. We've been recording Ruby Rogue since 2011. And we've talked to a lot of people who have had a really deep influence, not only on the programming community, but also on the Ruby community. And as we've talked to these people, it's become apparent to me that we talk a lot about the things that make them interesting that they've done. We don't really get into how they got into programming or how they came up in their career, how they got to be the person who invented whatever library or or technique that they came on the show to talk about. And so I put together a show where we actually highlight these things. We talk to them about how they got into programming. We talk to them about how they got into Ruby, maybe how they got into Rails. We get a little bit deep into what makes them tick and why they are the way they are. And then we talk about what they're working on. We talk about the things that make them well known or make them interesting. And a lot of times it's the stuff that goes beyond the code that really makes these people tick and makes them the kind of people that we want to hear about. And so I put together a show called My Ruby Story. You can find it at myrubystory.com. And it's where I interview these people and just get the stories of these people and how they came into programming. So if you want to hear inspirational stories or get ideas on how you can actually advance your career, then go check it out at myrubystory.com. All right. So let's, uh, if, if that's it, let's wrap up and uh, let's go through one thing you found interesting, you think is cool that you would tell a friend about. Since we're talking about interviews and algorithms and all that, Big Machine.io, don't, you know, Rob Connery, he's got the Imposters Handbook. I think the second version is out. But there's a lot of, cool stuff in there. So bigmachine.io, I would visit that. And if you have the money, invest in yourself. Go for it. I have a couple this week. First, like we've mentioned that Dylan has the 100-day algorithm challenge on Thinkster.io, but we've also started doing a 10-day challenge. And that's pretty fun because we've got a little contest that goes along with that. So definitely like check that out because it's a good introduction to what the 100-day course will be. But for anybody that completes it and turns in their challenge solutions to us, then you have a chance to win Thinkster Pro membership for a month. So it's kind of a cool thing. But yeah, just as an introduction to his 100-day course, check out the 10-day challenge. And you can find that on our Twitter account. We keep posting on it there. So check it out there. But then another thing I wanted to share, and Joe's probably heard me say this a couple times now. I know after, over the weekend, I, I was sending him some chat messages about it. And then he and I were just talking about it again. But if you have not seen the movie, The Art of Racing in the Rain, you need to go see it. It was fantastic. It's just one of those movies that stands out because it doesn't matter what you're going through in life. There's some part of that movie that will speak to you directly. So I would highly recommend The Art of Racing in the Rain. Fantastic movie. For me, I I would share that I'm a big believer of learning from multiple different sources. Like I think you're doing yourself a real disservice from just using one resource to learn stuff. And we've talked a little bit about books and we've talked about video courses. Another resource that'd be great for learning data structures and algorithms is the site pramp.com, which allows you to do free mock interviews and actually get that practice in. So you don't have to actually go and bomb at an actual company. You can go and uh, they have multiple different styles. And so that'd be something I would check into as well. I can go next. I've been doing a lot of traveling recently and I, I just got Google Fi as my phone provider. And it's if you're traveling internationally, it's like basically the best thing because it, it works in like 200 different countries. So, uh, and so far it's been great. So I, I'd recommend checking out Google Fi. I'll go next. And yeah, definitely Google Fi for international travel is awesome. I have one on topic and one off topic. I would say for the relevant to this episode, I really like the Base CS podcast. It is run by Code Newbie and hosted by mostly by Vaidhi Joshi and Saran, uh, who 
founded Code Newbie, but it's like a really lighthearted take on all of these uh, computer science concepts, and it's it's pretty enjoyable to listen to. And the episodes are short, and they give a lot of like really good real world examples that are silly enough to make you remember them. So I really like that. And then the other thing, I don't think I've mentioned this before, but the budgeting software, You Need a Budget, I freaking love it. I was using a lot of spreadsheets and other things, and as my finances got more complicated, I needed something better, and I really, really like You Need a Budget. So that's what I got. Cool. I'll go next on the tech side. Um, I just saw a post earlier this morning on uh, CSSTricks.com. They've got a tool that monitors the quality and complexity of CSS and gives you a a, a nice readout of of what you're doing there. Um, I think that's something that um, as developers that we sometimes forget um, how complex our CSS can get. And then on a uh, completely unrelated, I'm still on island time. If you haven't been to Hawaii, go. I love it. Um, Already planning my trip for next year. Had an absolutely great time. Joe, Joe, I think you're going to go next year with me. Is that is that right? I'm down. I'm down. Down. You're in. All right. Cool. Anybody else? Like, let's let's go. Let's get a big house. All right. <laughs> Lewis is raising his hand. He's in. I'm I'm uh-huh. I'm in. But I got my I got to bring my girlfriend if I go. She'll shoot me. Like, <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. We're gonna need a bigger house. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. I'll uh, pitch in with one thing. I was listening to a book on tape that was just absolutely fascinating called Stuff Matters. The first section was all about metals and uh, metallurgy. And man, it was just fascinating. Absolutely. The history of metals and metallurgy and just the complexities of it and how it affects the human race. Super cool. Absolutely fascinating nonfiction book. I feel like it was something really interesting. Stuff Matters. All right. Well, thanks everybody for coming and thanks uh, everybody for listening. And we'll be back with another episode. Bye. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Adios. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com to learn more.